This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I speak with Larry Robertson about border crossing, the difference between questioning versus inquiry, and taking a deliberate pause in your work. Enjoy the episode. Hey, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to have Larry Robertson. Larry Robertson is all about helping others explore the possible. He is a multi-award winning author of two books, A Deliberate Pause, Entrepreneurship and Its Moment in Human Progress, as well as his latest, The Language of Man, Learning to Speak Creativity. He is also the founder of Two Ventures and is a highly respected thought leader in creativity, innovation and entrepreneurship, advising individuals and organizations across a very broad spectrum. Larry is a former adjunct professor of entrepreneurship at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business, and his professional career has included roles with JP Morgan and the Walt Disney Company. It's my great pleasure to have Larry on the show today. So welcome, Larry. Oh, thank you, James. I've been looking forward to this and and am happy to be here. So share with our listeners, what's going on in your world just now? Well, I'll tell you right now, I am really having a lot of fun. Uh, Not that that's not something I try to do often, but... um, uh, it's a particularly great time for that. The the second book, which you mentioned, The Language of Man, just came out in the fall. And so I'm really spending a lot of time spreading those ideas and insights and in really diverse places. There, That includes speaking to groups like the secretaries of state of all the, the states in the United States, but also co-leading a yoga workshop based on ideas from the book and then co-leading just to, about a week and a half ago a workshop to help one of the UNESCO Creative Cities designees, Tucson, Arizona, think about what what that could mean. Great, we're, we've now been called a creative city, but what does that mean to our ongoing thinking about who we are, to our growth, and to the full range of people here? So it's really been fun to uh, work with these different people and uh, use the ideas that come from the language of man in very different ways. And that's really what's, what's consuming my uh, fun time right now. So in, in the language of, of man book, uh, you talk about the idea that creativity is not really the, the, the privilege of a few exceptional minds, but it's a, it's a language, it's our natural birthright. Yet you see all these studies, they keep coming out all the time. I think the last one, one of the last ones I saw was Adobe, the uh, corporation that found out that only 39% of the population worldwide consider themselves creative. A little bit, it's a little bit higher than that in, in the US and Europe, but a little bit lower than that in, in parts of Asia. So w- w- yeah, if that's you know in the, the, the kind of message in the book, why do so few people recognize that natural birthright of creativity? Yeah, isn't that really it, well? It's interesting from a, a couple of angles, and to add to the studies that you're talking about, there are, over the last decade, a little more than a decade, there have been these consistent studies done by very large organizations, a, a Price Waterhouse Coopers or an IBM, and, and and Adobe was part of these as well, where they've gone to leaders internationally. They'll look across dozens of industries and even dozens of countries. And the, the surveys are quite large. They're, they're typically uh, several thousand people that they're surveying. And all these leaders are saying that the most strategic, the, the most important strategic imperative for their future, the the most important skill in their businesses is creativity. And yet, these studies also show this enormous gap between that statement and how these companies actually work, what their cultures are like, how they go about hiring, the incentives they provide to their employees, none of which really feed this idea of, great, we want you to be creative. We're trying to give you the environment where you can do that. That's not happening. And so I think that really comes back to your, your question. We use this word a lot, creativity or, or being creative, but our understanding of it is lacking for most people and in most cases. Having said that, I mean, think back to to any of our our childhoods or just look at at any kid under the age of five or six, which is, by the way, at least here in the United States is when we start public schooling, and you will see that they naturally show these inquisitive traits, the desire to discover uh, when they get 
burned. I put that words in, in quotes. It, 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 things don't work out the way that they thought they would in something they experimented with. They, they find a way to come at it again or go around it. It's a natural inclination to want to discover, to want to think outside our boundaries. However, we have a lot of reinforcing forces from uh, the time we, we start our education all the way up into the places that, that we work or the societies in which we work that are, are trying to orient us more towards that order side of our brain. And so in the process, we forget that we also have this very open side of our brain and we need both in balance if we want to continue to progress and frankly, be happy. And you mentioned you know, that that stage of the, the you know kids go through they're in that kind of natural flow state uh, you know in that that four or five and then they go to school and they kind of hit that that fourth grade slump um, mm. where you know creativity you see start to decline um, when when people kind of come out because I know ed, ed, creativity and education is another big field on its own but I know that many of the, the the organizations that you speak to they're in the world of work, they're large companies or, or, or you know, large even government uh, kind of organizations as well. So when, it, when you're speaking to those groups, many of whom I'm guessing people that might not necessarily consider themselves creative or would not identify as, as creative, how do, you get, how do you get started with them? How do you even just put that chink in there for them to even consider themselves that they have this creative capability? It's a great question. And what I do when I talk to groups like that and what I also describe in the language of man is if you if you think of the human population of the world like a very simple pie chart, you know, draw it on a piece of paper in front of you or draw it in your mind. And then you draw this tiny little slice, the kind of slice that would leave you hungry for, for more pie. That tiny slice are the people who truly consider themselves creative and and not not just capable of it, but are acting on it, this tiny, tiny little slice. And that major portion of the rest of the pie are those people who've been wrongly told they're not creative. Now, I don't mean that they have people surrounding them necessarily who say, you just aren't creative, although that happens. It's just that the encouragement of those those habits and those things in that individual that would allow them to lean towards their creative side um, are, are sometimes discouraged, but they're often not rewarded, and they're not built into the you know as I said the the, the systems in which we're uh, taught how to be uh, productive members of society. I guess you could put it that way. So where I begin with them is to say, look you really have been wrongly told or you've wrongly interpreted that you're not creative. And you can look not just at uh, the research on creativity to prove that, but if you look at the evolutionary research that's been done about how we've evolved, how we've evolved physically, but also how our, our, our brains have evolved within our physical structure and how we've evolved socially, what you see is that we have these two mindsets that we that we have in our heads, but we also need to feed. And I refer to them as fox and hedgehog. And that comes from a, a, a single surviving line of an ancient Greek poem that said, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows just one big thing. Mm. And if you think about that, the fox is the side of our brain that is constantly curious, wondering about what's possible. Uh, tuning into what I think of as a sense of fit. Hey, that, you know, something just occurred that didn't quite go with how I expected things to go. The hedgehog is the part of us that that is focused on order. Even when that fox discovers really interesting things, the hedgehog eventually has to come in and turn it into something tangible, create value from it. So what I try to do is help people realize that we are built from hundreds of thousands of years of evolution to have to be capable of of both of these mindsets so the fact that you might not think you're creative doesn't mean you don't have the capacity it just means you're out of practice and when it comes to a team context so you you have you know the, the complexity of larger organizations and teams where maybe some people are in the they're told they're in the they almost e might even have a title which says creative in the in the title as well and then mm -hmm. you have other folks who have tit have titles which maybe don't sound that creative as well so how how do you um work with the the the, the creatives 
in terms of helping them understand their hedgehog nature. And then with the the folks who are maybe in those departments, which you don't necessarily think is the creative ones, to really kind of start unlocking that, that creative capability and capacity they have sure. within them. Sure. Well, you know, the first thing is, is to help them realize that even though the creatives might lean more towards Fox and the uh, not not to pick on them because they're not they don't lack creativity, but the accountants might lead more lean more towards Hedgehog. The first thing is to say, hey, you're both built with both mindsets. So the fact that you lean one way or the other isn't a, a comment on one of you was born with only the Fox and one was born with only the Hedgehog mindset. Um but the the second thing that I really focus on is how much they need one another. So if the creative person is constantly coming up with these really intriguing ideas, they're constantly pushing the, the borders and the boundaries of not only what they know, but what their organization knows, that's terrific unless it never turns into something tangible, unless the idea never becomes a reality, unless that idea never generates value, not just for the person who came up with the idea, but for many people, and not just people within the organization, but beyond it. There's there's a need for us to have this balance between the two. And the hedgehog, that order side of our brain, is really important for helping to sort those creative ideas, for helping us think about uh, what kind of value might be generated generated from them and who would be interested in that. And so it's really learning from one another that's so critically important. The other thing is, is that if you think about this, the you know, you, you described it as as people within a particular organization. There, if you think if you think about each of them as having kind of borders around what they know, uh, what they feel comfortable with, how they do things, those borders abut one another in an organization. And so, what I really try to teach them about is border crossing. And it's the idea that you can come from that more hedgehog accounting view of the world, but there's a benefit from making forays into that more creative side of the organization and of the creative person there. So it doesn't mean you have to become like them. But the second you step across your own border, three wonderful things happen. The first is when you go into a zone that's not your comfort zone, even if you just put your toe in, you can't help but see differently. You're going to see something over there that's different than what you've known before. Is it going to be this big mega idea? Not necessarily and probably not likely, but you're going to see differently. The second wonderful thing that happens is when you come back within your borders, you can't help but look at what you know well in a different way, even if it's slight. And the third thing is, is that if you are in the habit of crossing those borders back and forth between the hedgehog and the fox, the creative and, say, the more orderly side of, of, uh, of, of any particular organization, you actually expand what's possible beyond just, you know, one plus one, what existed on one side and what existed on the other side, because you truly are seeing new opportunities and things differently. In fact, in one of your recent um, podcasts where, you know, you're just sharing ideas and lessons, you, you talked about that that power of exploring and expanding these ideas just by going out and, and exploring this accumulation of little experiences that allow you to see things differently. Absolutely. And it's interesting. I, I just interviewed someone uh, Dr. K. H. Kim, from uh, who wrote a very influential uh, uh, piece called the, uh, "The Creativity Crisis," looking at there was the decline of creativity in America from about 1990 and why why that was happening. And she has a new study which is going to be released mm. very soon, which takes the latest data. And one of her previous works was on something you just meant that what you just mentioned there, this idea of border crossing, or, or I think she called it maybe boundary crossing in her case, where she looked at um, some of the leading Nobel Prize winners. And she she wondered, was there a connection between intelligence, i.e. IQ intelligence, and creativity? And what she found was that there was not really a, a, a connection there. There used to be this idea of the threshold, um, you know, th you need a certain kind of threshold of, of a 120 um, IQ in order to be creative. And she kind of blew the idea of the, out of the water. But what she discovered, these uh, the top Nobel Prize winners, who also are some of the most creative people as well, regardless mm -hmm. of whether it's the sciences or on the arts, was that they were extremely good 
at that border crossing you spoke about. Mm. You know, they were good at taking ideas from one place and, and moving into another, even if that sometimes got, got them into trouble as well. So from your perspective, because you're, you're known as a consultant, you're out speaking, you're a writer. Where do you go to get your kind of ideas, your inspiration? What, what areas are you looking to just, just now, which might surprise people? They might think, well, what, how does that relate to creativity? Yeah, it's it's a great question. So the the first way in which I get that naturally through my work is that my consulting work over the years, which by and large has been focused on um, entrepreneurs. So it's it's people, groups, and organizations where the ideas are either in those earliest stages or in they're in their highest growth stages, rather than you know an organization that's become a little more predictable, a little more static. And what I focus on are the very things that we're talking about and how you how you launch an idea, how how you take an idea and not just make it appeal to others, but make others want to, and I'll put this word in quotes as well, invest in it, whether that's buying your product or it's actually investing in your company, it's coming to work for your company, or it's even blogging about your company and saying how, how great it is. So I'm really helping them focus on that idea idea of growth, how you anticipate it and how you manage it when you get there. The answer to your question is that while I'm focused on that, I'm very industry agnostic because those kinds of challenges and what you do about them are really common across every human endeavor. And so I'm moving from one industry to another, one zone to another, from for-profits to non-profits. And in that process, I'm not trying to be an expert in the business of any particular individual or company that I work with. I might know a lot about it, but that's their cup of tea. That's what they know well. And what I'm trying to help them do is to see those larger patterns. Uh, A second way that I do it is I read really broadly. So I don't just read in the same genres. Um, I really push into zones sometimes that are even types of reading that I don't particularly enjoy just to get my brain to think in a different way. And then I guess the the third way that I, I feel like I do that is this, this may sound funny to you, but I, I have two kids. I have a 17-year-old and a 14-year-old. And, you know, in, in the teen years, I think there's typically a battle between parents and kids uh, for airspace and, and for who gets to make the, the winning point. I really try to focus on listening to them and hearing what they're saying. I may not agree with it, and I may not conclude the same things they do, but where they're coming from is a different place than where my brain is coming from. And their brain is in full developmental mode. So sometimes it's not just the the statement they make, but thinking about how did they get to it and why do they think that way and what other things that they're experiencing attached to that. So it's like, you know, I, I think of them as my two little science projects and I'm trying to benefit in my own thinking by going into their zone more often and not just being the, the parent that says, well, it's because I said so that you're going to do it this way. And that, that sounds what you're doing there says a little bit like picking up on, on one of the parts of the book where you talk about the difference between questioning and inquiry in mm. creativity. Can, can, you, can you talk a little bit about that for our, our listeners where, you know, we often think that, you know, creativity is all about questioning in that sense. But you, but you make some distinctions around that. Yeah, absolutely. So w- w- one of the one of the real focal points of the book is how important questions are to creativity. However, if I was just to leave it at that statement, it's very easy to say, uh, okay, well, I, then I just I need to come up with a with a question that drives me to think creatively, come up with ideas, create something, and as soon as I have the answer, that question will have done its job. Inquiry is a little different. So inquiry includes answer or asking questions of a whole range of things, but what inquiry really is about is reminding you to return to the question, reminding you to add other questions to it rather than being about seeking 
uh, an answer or the answer to something. So that that's a, a real big difference. And I'll I'll give you a wonderful example. So you were talking about the the researcher who has interviewed Nobel laureates, and as part of the language of man, I interviewed MacArthur uh, Award winners. They, this is what's popularly known as the Genius Award, and it's the only award that's given for creativity in the broadest sense. So in spending a lot of time talking to them, one of the MacArthur fellows I talked to was this woman, Deborah Meyer, who happens to be an education reformer. And she actually uses questions, she calls them the five habits of the mind, to help guide her teams into exploring new ideas and then making new ideas real. So they start with the first habit or the first question, which is, uh, how do you know what you know? And even a question as simple as that is allowing you to go back and revisit your assumptions, see which variables might have changed, which ones might be new to the process, which is something we rarely do. Yeah. And I, I won't go through all the patterns, but the, or the, all the questions, but the second habit of the mind or the second question she asks is, is there a pattern? Because as you look at how you know what you know, you might see these things that stand out. But if they only stand out once, there's a good chance they're just an anomaly and they're not really signaling anything significant. But if there's a pattern that follows that signal or a pattern of that signal occurring, even if in different forms, in a similar way, it's probably something that's either revealing a new opportunity or maybe a potential threat. So that's a case where the question is driving the thinking in the larger sense and the activities rather than the question driving towards a set answer. Well, that's great. And it reminds me a little bit, um, I think we had uh, uh, Warren Berger on the show a while back. And, and he said something which is kind of related to that. He said often he'll go and work with organizations and individuals uh, uh, on like an ideation sessions you know, pre- pre- or brainstorming kind of style sessions. Uh, and he said so much of the time that they're completely fixated on finding the answers to some question. And mm-hmm. they never actually take any time to question are, are these the right questions to be asking. And, I, and he said if they spent more time brainstorming around the questions unless nestle <laughs> around what the answers are they might find some more insights from that as it, well it's so interesting that you say that so one of the other uh, macarthur fellows i spoke to rebecca newberger goldstein who is both a philosopher and a <laughs> a writer of fiction which is an interesting combination she talks about asking unprofessional questions and and it and it's a pattern actually across MacArthur Fellows that they are asking those very questions that are typically left out, either because the habit is not to go there or because the drive is towards a particular answer that looks like what we know before. But sometimes by just flipping the question around, almost asking the inverse metaphor that the that the question symbolizes, it's a way to go at um, are we really looking at the right thing? Are we really asking the right questions? And in fact, one of Deborah's other habits of the mind is, is there another way of looking at this? And it turns out to be a very powerful question, both for testing new ideas to see, you know, you, you, we get excited about new ideas because they look positive, but it helps test where they're weak and how you might reinforce those or how, how you might address those things. But sometimes that question actually reveals something completely different. So I think that idea of going there, asking those unprofessional questions or those unasked questions is critical to really developing that inquiry mindset. So in in your own creative life, can you tell us about a time where you worked on a project yourself or one of your clients and you you know gave it your heart and your soul, but for whatever reason, it just didn't work out like you hoped. And, and, And what were the lessons that you took from that experience? Gosh, you know, James, it, the, the hard part is that I could tell you many both <laughs> micro and macro sized versions of that. I, I think of that as, you know, rather than say what people might conclude as, well, that failed, I think of it as all the times that things didn't work out as I expected. And those have not only happened a lot, but they continue to happen. I think really a more interesting one that still uh, addresses your, your question is when I realized that all of the time that I'd spent decades 
focused on uh, entrepreneurship and really opening people's minds up to how do you think entrepreneurially, not just how do you develop an entrepreneurial venture. Um, all of that time I'd spent, all of the things I'd built had generated a lot of positives. But I was hit with this, this moment, this wave where I said, you know what, somehow this just isn't right. This isn't enough. It's good. And it makes my life happy and smooth and things like that. But it feels like something significant is missing. And so uh, to me, that was more important because rather than it being a moment of failure that you were forced to face, it was really a moment of um, opportunity, something missing that I could choose to face. And I would suggest that that was not only more important, but it was a heck of a lot harder to set aside a lot of the things that I'd built uh, parts of my business, certain boards that I was on, certain things that generated money for me to set those aside and pursue that thing that was missing. And quite honestly, that thing that was missing was a greater focus on creativity. So making that that move from where you were doing the consulting work on the, the entrepreneurial, the growth type, it, you know, thinking, framing it from that perspective mm -hmm. and turning away some of that, that work. So you were focusing more on, on the meta part of, of the creativity, the creativity mm -hmm. angle. Uh, I mean, what were some of the, the, the thoughts and feelings that were going in your head? Because I'm sure for many of our listeners who may be at that point in their lives and their business just now, where they're thinking about making some quite seismic change in, in their business and their focus on their business. Talk, talk to me about you know the, the feelings that you were having in that stage of actually making the change and and where you where you're at now with it. Sure. That, it's uh, uh, thank you for the question. It's it's a great one. So I would tell you that where it began was this with this sense of fit. We are we all have a built-in sense of fit, meaning when we notice things that stick out from the normal pattern or from what we know. And that can be, uh, hmm, I, 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 I sense that there could be an opportunity, a better fit, or I sense a misfit. We tend to try to quiet that noise. So we don't tune into our sense of fit. And yet, it's not only part of our, our built-in survival system, it is the very thing that helps us to come up with new ideas, to think about the future, to, to progress forward. So early on, it was feeling this, this nagging feeling that even with the good things that were going on, something didn't fit quite right and the first thing I did was try to ignore that the very thing I shouldn't have done oh, wait, wait, Once wait, I wait, where did that feeling uh, you know was it was it kind of feeling in your gut or was it something you know you just felt in your head or was it just it was a nagging what, what was it what did it actually feel like uh, well yeah I'll give you a very specific example so you mentioned that I taught for three and a half years as an adjunct professor in at Georgetown University in the in the business school. And every time I would end a semester, I would do my own personal assessment of, did I reach those students? So these are people past their undergraduate years, and they've it's some, many of them, most of them really, had had some professional experience, and they were coming back for this degree to learn something more, to hopefully go out in the world and do things better than they had done before, whatever version of that might be. And I would try to tune into, did the things that I taught them, which were really about moving to the edges of who they were, uh, finding out how bold they were willing to be, that, you know, the focus of the course was entrepreneurship, but I was was really focusing it on them. And did I reach them in some way that they looked at themselves differently? They, they took away the lessons that I was trying to convey, but they saw the broader possibility in that. And so when I felt that semester after semester, even though the percentages were high for what I assessed as the, the positive impact I was having, I kept looking at it and saying, that's not enough. Somehow in this format, the way I'm teaching it and what I'm emphasizing isn't enough to reach as many people as I want to, to send other people forward in the world with these ideas so they can shape them into their own thing. So that was a very clear signal to me where I could have looked at the reviews I got as a professor, which were always super high, and I could have just done you know, continue to do that. Or the school was pleased with me. I could have continued to teach uh, there and just, you know, rested on my laurels. But inside me, it didn't feel 
right. It didn't feel like it was enough. And that really built into something larger, which was this concept of I've got to dig deeper into creativity and I have to do it in a setting that's different from what I've done. It's what I call in the first book, a deliberate pause, that no choice factor. That I looked out at the world and said, no one is looking at creativity quite the way I think they should. Somebody has to do that. I have to be the person to do that because in my gut, I know it will not only be better for me, it will be better for, in quotes, the world, at least that part of it that I touch. And that's ultimately what I couldn't turn away from. And what you said there, I think it's really important where you mentioned no one could say it in the way that you were saying or the way that you were thinking about it. I think so many people, they don't write that book or they don't go out and give that, that speech or they don't build that business because they say, well, someone's already built that business or, or written that book, but they haven't written it in the way that you'd write it in your voice as, as well. And um, it always amazes me when, I, when I, I hear that from people that are thinking about writing a book, that is, you know, we're talking about in this case in business and entrepreneurship. Uh, and they say, well, there's, there's already lots of books about, say, marketing, for example. I, say, mm-hmm. well, I probably have like 40 books in my, in, in my library on marketing, but I like different books um, because I like the way that that person thinks about marketing and, and talks about marketing and explains marketing and the concepts, while sure. my, my wife might like a completely different book from me because she likes the voice of that person as well. So the fact that you, you recognize that in your, yourself, that you that not only was this an area that you want to do, but you had that you had that voice and you had something interesting and special to say and distinct to say, I think is, is an incredible, um, incredible thing, especially the fact you could have very easily just carried on with one path and still had that gut feeling it's, it wasn't quite, what, quite right. Something was missing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's interesting too, James, if you, if you think about it, um, we all have that something special to share. N- not all of us can articulate it right now. But when we start to get, my dad used to call it gut feel. When we start to get that feeling that that there's something important that we have to say or something that we feel passionate about, one of the critical things is to tune into that. Does it mean that we're always going to pursue it, uh, always going to pursue it right away if we do pursue it, or that we'll all do it in the same way? Of course not. But it's that whole idea of awareness and not ignoring or normalizing your that sense of fit, but really tuning into what it means that's so critically important. And to your very example, even as I was writing each of my books, I mean, think of the topics, entrepreneurship, creativity. There, there are dozens of books. I, I could probably say hundreds of books on each of those topics. As I was writing them, and each of them took you know several years to really write through the whole process, I continued to tune in to my to my sense of fit, but also to my voice to say, do I still feel that I have something different to share? And and it had to go deeper than am I oh my God, I'm writing another book on creativity. There's so many out there who's gonna read it. That wasn't why I was writing it. I felt there was something different that needed to be looked at, that needed to be said, and that was beneficial to those that would pick it up. And I think if you continue to do that, it's almost like um, some people call it, you know, fast failing or fast testing, or it, it's like a, a lean startup approach to writing. You're constantly looking at what you're doing and doing that assessment of how do I know what I know? Deborah's question. And, you know, is there a pattern in it? And does it really say something meaningful? Meaningful that I got to continue to pursue. So it's an ongoing thing. And you mentioned people like Deborah, these incredible MacArthur, uh, MacArthur fellows that you interviewed. What what was some of the best advice that you received uh, from these people, or from other people that you've you've, you've met in your life and your work about you know, living a creative life and, and and doing great creative work? <laughs> I'll tell you my I'll tell you my favorite story about that. So I interviewed nearly 70 MacArthur fellows and I would ask them some similar questions, you know, and then I'd just follow the conversation. But at the end of the conversation, I was in the habit of of asking a question, something like this, what did I not ask you? Or what did we not talk about that's important to a conversation like this? So I was within the first, you know, 10 or so of these these conversations that I was having. And I was talking with this gentleman named uh, Pedro Sanchez. And I asked him that very question. What have I not asked you or what should we be talking about? And Pedro said, what do you do for fun? And I said, oh, you know, surprised to have a question coming back at me. Well, I love to kayak. I love to hike. I, I coach my kid's sport team. And, and he interrupted me and he said, no what do you do for fun? That's the question you didn't ask me. Mm. 
And what was so powerful of that is, first of all, I knew that fun and, a, and an element of play, especially in doing hard things or pursuing unknowns, was critical. But I, even somebody looking as broadly at creativity as I was, I had done some quieting or normalizing of that signal. And what Pedro was saying is, despite all the other things we could talk about as it relates to creativity, for him, and it turned out across the MacArthur Fellows, this idea of fun and play was absolutely critical in not just keeping you going, not just adding an, a, an element of enjoyment to a process that can sometimes be very frustrating, demoralizing, and everything else. It was actually that window that allowed you to border cross, that allowed you to see something different, that allowed you to tune into your sense of fit. So for me, that was the best advice, not only saying that play is important, but he was really tuning me into my own questions and my own sense of fit by bringing me back to that topic. That's a one. That's a wonderful question um, answer from him as well. And um, it reminds me. It reminds me a little bit. There was uh, the writer Elizabeth Gilbert uh, mm-hmm. was, was uh, recounting a story. She was a, a book signing, uh, not actually one of hers. She was listening to a, an author, I think a well-known journalist, who, who was uh, delivering some talk about their latest book. And at, at some point in the in the process, uh, someone stood up, asked a question. This gentleman asked a question. He said, "So, I grew up at the same time as you. We we went to the same colleges. I've been writing just as long as you, um, but I've never had the success that you have had as a writer. What mm. would you suggest I do?" Mm-hmm. And and the, uh, the the gentleman was asked was being asked a question. Thought for a second, and he said, "Give up." which completely floored everyone in, in the room because it's not the kind of question, the answer you normally expect. And then he paused, right. it, he paused a little bit longer for dramatic effect. And he said, but if after a couple of weeks or a couple of months, you find yourself having to write, you have to just pick up the pen or have to start writing on, on that laptop, then you're a writer. This is mm. what you do for fun. This is your play. And that's yeah. where you should just follow. So it's a great story and it's great advice. It's it, interestingly, James, it's it's close to a question that I've heard you ask some of your your guests before, which is, you know, what do you what do you say to people who say, gee, I want to do what you do? Mm. And my answer is always don't. Mm. Because it it really is my way of trying to tune them into we we have this sense of of what I call the the problem of one or the problem of formulas. And we we see a model out there. We see someone celebrated or we see someone that that we see only through all their their wins. We we don't even calculate that they may have had losses and stumbles. And we think if we can figure out how they did it, how how I can be Elizabeth Gilbert, then that that's what will bring me to whatever my story is and 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 my destiny. And nothing could be further for, from the truth. So stories like hers and the one she told are really important reference points, but ultimately we're each writing our own story. And to the extent that we fail to keep that in mind and just try to find and follow a model of others, we're really setting ourselves up for that, for frustration and disappointment, and we're measuring our progress or success or happiness or whatever you want to say by somebody else's metrics. So, Larry, let's get some of your recommendations now. Um, do you have an online resource or a tool or an app like Evernote, for example, that you absolutely love? What would that What would that be? Interestingly, my answer to that is no, because for me, they are all tools. So I will tell you um, how I use them. As long as it's fun and or effective, I keep using it. And when it ceases to be that, not just in one moment, but you know, it starts to develop as a pattern of not being fun or effective, I move to something else or I reduce the number of tools I'm using. And if you could recommend just one record and one book to our listeners, what would they be? You know, I love to hear others answer this question because I always get great ideas, but it is such a hard question for me to answer because I love music and I love reading. But I would, I would answer this way. The book I've read the most and at the most, uh, the, the widest range of points in my life is The Old Man and the Sea. Mm. And every time I come away from it, I see something different. So maybe it's revisiting a book, maybe it's that particular book, but that's one that I've tuned into multiple times. And in terms of a, a record, um, 
again, hard, but I would say Roseanne caches the list. And what I love about it is that she picked these songs from a list that her father sat down and wrote out for her, her father, Johnny Cash, saying, if you are really going to be in the music industry, you must know these hundred songs. You must, uh, a wide range of them. And she picked from those, that list, a dozen songs to sing on this record. So it's got great history. It's got her voice, perfect duets. It's a really interesting album. Wonderful. And we'll put all these in the show notes. People just go to jamestail.me, type in Larry Robertson, and you'll get the links for all of these as well. So final question for you, Larry. Let's imagine you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. You had to, to begin again. Uh, so you've got the tools of your trade and the knowledge that you've acquired over these years, but you have no contacts. No one knows who you are. How would you restart and what would you do? <laughs> I'd go kayaking. And I'll tell you why I say that. Um, First of all, it's going to get me outdoors. That, as I said earlier, is one of those ways that I begin to see things differently. Second of all, it's something that, at least in terms of the equipment and my ability, I'm completely in control of. So it puts me in a different zone, but I have a sense of control. And I think what most of us do in a moment like that is we try to immediately get down to how do we rebuild or how do we regain what, what we've lost. And I never find that very productive because usually when things are taken away or fall apart or something happens unexpectedly, it's a good clue that maybe you need to rethink and come at it a different way. And when I sit in a kayak, uh, that's my way of sorting those thoughts best. Well, Larry, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I'm going to let you get away and jump in that kayak, go down that river. <laughs> and uh, your latest book, Language of Man, uh, Learning to Speak Creativity, is out. Uh, people can get links at jameshill.me and just look for Larry Robertson. Thank you so much for coming. And what's the best way for people to also to connect with you to learn more about your writing and, and the other work that you do? Sure. The simplest way to learn that full range is to go to LarryRobertson.me, M-E, and you'll find it's just a three-page website that points you to the things you might be interested in. Well, Larry, thanks so much for coming on the show today, and I wish you all the best with your, your writing and your kayaking. Take care. You too. Thanks, James. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.